I'm just, I just, I'm just like. start of it a whole laugh pick up microphone now She said she was signing in? Yeah, because I messaged her and said, um, so there's an invite, sometimes it automatically just provides the Google Meet. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Go hello. again. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Can you hear my mic? It's good. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Hi, uh, Julia, can you hear us? Yes, sorry about that. That's okay. I had, your, um, I had your old Zoom link that I was using. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. I'm like, why is this not working? <laughs> <laughs> how's your How's your week going? Uh, a little crazy. Yeah. yeah. A little fire drill this morning at work, but no, no worries. <laughs> Already, gosh, midweek fire drill. Because yeah, it's nine a.m. there. Jeez. Do you usually start pretty early? I do. Like, I jump on around like seven thirty, eight o'clock. And then, you know, just to get caught up for the day and geared up for the day. So, yeah. Sure. Are you back in the office already, I? Mm hmm Right. No, uh, <laughs> my colleagues are. I work remote. Oh, right. So they had a fire drill. <laughs> yeah, oh. meaning like. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> like there was an issue with something. Oh, with right, 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 okay. right. Yeah, yeah. I, not, I, like, I, I know the expression fire putting out drill. fires. I just didn't realize it was an expression I fire drill. I'm so glad that you said that because I remember my <laughs> very first corporate job outside of school, outside of like yeah. university. Perfect. And someone made that comment and I was like, oh my gosh, like there's a fire. <laughs> <laughs> then, like, do we need to, do we need to evacuate the building? And they're like, Oh, come here, young one. You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's so many phrases and acronyms and yeah, it's a whole different world. <laughs> so funny. Well, I'm, is there, is everything okay? Is it still a good time? Yeah, no, this is fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And do you have any heart? Cause I know that you are in the midst of stuff. Are you, do you have a hard stop with when we need to wrap up? Let me check. Uh, I think I'm good. I don't have any, yeah, I don't have anything right after this. So yeah, I have a little more time. Okay. It should yeah. probably be about an hour anyway. Just wanted to you know, make sure that we had your, your time in mind. So, yeah. um, well, thanks for sending over all of the, the answers and stuff. It's funny. We normally just send over the outline just so people have an idea, especially yeah. if you haven't heard the podcast before, sure. but, uh, this is really helpful. So we've got a lot of good stuff to go off of awesome. and you, yeah, have you've heard our podcast before too. I haven't. I haven't had a chance. Oh, that's okay. That's fine. Okay. You saw the, I apologize. No, you're good. You saw the format. And actually I'm I'm um I'm experimenting soon with a new format, which is basically taking the podcast audio and then turning it mm -hmm. into clips on like Instagram and email and things like that. Great. Too. So this is it's really okay. good. You also wrote out a lot. So I'll be able to take that and make it into different nuggets. Can would you, you tell you also, I'm a writer? <laughs> no, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, like, I can keep going. Yeah. You brought up such a great, um, you brought up such great points, especially with the different mediums. And that's also what reminded me of like, I need to take these, like we get these audio chunks and then they mm-hmm. go up on Spotify and then we'll post about it, but there's such good content. So being able to disperse it across yeah. the mediums is really great. Um, quick question before we get started. Uh, so you answered this in your in the stuff you sent through to us. Is there a particular point you want to get across? Um, so is there a, like essentially that we like to ask all our uh, guests? Is there anything you want us to talk about because it's valuable for your business? And is there anything you don't want us to talk about because you don't feel comfortable discussing it? So like, yeah, to great questions. Um, I think the most important point is for equestrians to realize there is a host, there is so much horse tech out there. They need to really be curious. Um, They need to start seeking out more. There is a lot of tools that can help them. And whether it's barn management or performance, whether they're themselves or their horse, I mean, and even the horse care. So the vet, the whole vet veterinary aspect um, I just think that people aren't really aware of all these things out there. And even people within the horse tech industry aren't aware of everything that's out there. Yeah. I guess. So I think the more that, and that's really why I built the blog is we need to create an awareness on a much higher level, whether people like use it every day or maybe, you know, once a year, the fact that technology gives us access to so much more than we ever realized is probably the most important thing I want to get across. Yeah. Okay. Um, I feel like that was thing- such a great intro even. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You yeah, said yeah. it so beautifully. <laughs> like that's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, like, and I get so passionate and so excited because I'm like, actually when I do meet people and they're not aware, it actually gets me more excited because I'm like, yeah. you have no idea. There's so many great things that you should check out. <laughs> um, just to expand your repertoire with riding and your horse. And I, I feel like there's so much we can learn sure. um, and, and things are so, you know, changing so rapidly as well on the tech side. Sure. Sure. Um, sure. The one as far thing as I'm trying, the- yeah, I'm trying to get better at, and, and that's to the second part of your question is I'm trying not to say too many horse tech vendor names. I'm trying to be neutral okay. because I really want people to explore and see what works for them. All right. So when we talk about tech, talk more about um, the sort of thing, problems that tech solves as opposed to the companies that are solving it. Correct. Okay. Um, What about, uh, we've talked about in the past, how you want to start a conference. Is that Mm -hmm. something you want to talk about or is that something you don't want to talk about so that no one steals your idea? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, let's let's not go there yet. Okay. Well, see, I, I I don't think that anyone like it's a lot of work. People can't just throw on a successful event, and you, so I'd say if you don't want to talk about it because you're worried that someone will steal the idea, I don't think the chances of that. I'm not worried about that. Okay. I'm worried about like I'm the type of person like I kind of want to have everything buttoned up a yeah. bit before yeah. I release it before you yeah. announce it. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'd feel awful if people are like, oh, I wish, you know, I wonder when that's happening. And, and then it doesn't come to fruition for like th- five years. <laughs> I don't, but, that, but in the same breath, I could see people being like, oh man, I too have been thinking about this. And like, Juliana is the perfect one to get this that's going because she is so connected. And then, and then that can help just providing perfect. like devil's advocate. Yeah, would you, would you be willing to talk about the conference in the context of like, there needs to be a conference, not saying That's that true. you're I could do not, that. saying yeah. that you're like, not saying that you're going to do it. So you're not mm-hmm. on the hook, yeah. but talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. the fact of like, there needs to be a space where all these things are coming together in reality, because at the moment, the mm-hmm. tech world isn't talking to each other. Yeah. Right. So, right. Yeah. And it, That's true. Oh no, there's a, <laughs> we're we're in this Airbnb in Austin, and I guess we have no control over the outside elements. And we're on the second floor, and someone's doing lawn work right yeah, outside. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think I think you'll only be here for about a minute. <laughs> Can you hear it? Is it is it picking up on your end? A little bit, yeah. 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 I don't it, think he'll be here long. He's moving pretty quickly. Um, we'll just wait till he's gone to actually start. Yeah, to start okay. recording. Okay, so then, um, but yeah, I, th- I think it would be great just to like t- 
talk about the concept of it because there could be someone there that's like, oh, I've got the, maybe Weck is listening in like, oh, I've got the venue. Like I want to put this on, but I don't have the subject matter expertise. So who, like yeah. who knows what could come I know, The other thing too is, is that we're currently in Austin. And so <laughs> starting next week is South by Southwest. Is it next week? That's right, week? yeah. Right, yeah. Next week or the week after. Oh my so God. just like my point is, is like it Anything would be, a, it's an easy <laughs> thing for us to talk about right now <laughs> yeah. because of where we are. Um, yeah. All right. So then what else? I, yeah. It's such a, it's such good input. Um, I'm pulling it up right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, hey, is the podcast, is it video or no, it's just voice, right? It's just uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we, we do record the video in the event that like down the line, we actually want to release the video. So we do keep them on file, but to date we've only released them all by uh by by audio and um if we were going to release it by video we'd contact them you guys and be like okay. hey are you happy for okay. us to release this yeah yeah <laughs> and, the, and, the event, and this part like, would be would be taken out yeah, yeah the only one video that we did was for jeff newman who is the ceo or he is the ceo of um maryland five star so <laughs> and he wanted just extra promotion so we did that for him nice. yeah normally okay. we don't yeah um well we're gonna have to yeah. Clean up our background if we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, they seem to be gone. He's almost out of earshot. Yeah. Just give it a couple minutes, um, a minute or so. Um, then I'm trying to think too, because one, are there other events that are coming up that you either like will be at or are looking to like draw attention to, or just like, is there anything like, for example, we had um, an artist coming up and she had certain things that she was uh attending maybe it's certain blog releases or just certain press releases that people should be like thinking about in the future or is it more like nothing definitive to date yeah not that i can think of okay. yeah um i mean event i'll be going to is the longines global champions they're having their miami beach grand prix in april so mm. right. I, that's been on my bucket list for like you know five years now <laughs> Yeah. So. Is it so? What it, what is that event? Just like a huge show jumping Grand Prix. Yeah. Okay. And it's right on the beach. It's it is so oh, gorgeous. I know what you're talking about. So that's yeah. not, that's not the uh, WEF. It's just a completely separate thing. Correct. It's totally separate. Okay. Mm -hmm. It looks yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> looks very American. So. <laughs> But the images of the horses jumping and then you see the turquoise water behind them. I mean, it's stunning. just stunning. Yeah. Is it um is it only Grand Prix too, or do they offer it for lower levels? I think it's pretty high level. Okay, yeah, it makes yeah. sense. It's such a venue. And but and they yeah. turn it into a proper arena, right? It's not like it's just on the same. They sand. do. Yeah. Okay. Do. That makes sense. I was gonna say it's <laughs> bold choice otherwise. Oh, yeah. I, I I couldn't hear it anymore. Is it <laughs> He's blowing, it's blowing a gale outside. And yeah, did you yell at them? And he's got a leaf blower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was so weird. Yesterday it was like 85 degrees and just stagnant in the afternoon. And then by 6 p.m. it was freezing and mm. we were in a wind tunnel. So I don't know, Austin weather is super weird. So that yeah. is weird, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you can hear us? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> all right, well, I think we should be good. So uh, we can get okay. into it in the interest of time. Cool. I'm gonna get my notes together. I really love the intro that you already had. Like you were, when you were starting off so casually. Yeah. <laughs> it's always the best. It's like, it, there, yeah, whenever <laughs> someone's like, okay, ready, that record. And then it's like, yeah. oh. And then they're like, oh. I don't know my yeah, name. Yeah, the other thing too is, so, I mean, when we do these podcasts, we never really have notes. Um, I mean, we have your notes here, but like for the guests and stuff. And I'm not sure if Jen said it, but like we can, um, if it's something you want to do, we can definitely send you the podcast to review before we publish it so that mm. if there's anything yeah. you want to cut, you can cut it. So okay. don't feel the need to be able to like speak perfectly and stick to script. Yeah. Well, especially because okay. like when you were talking about what are the things you want to talk about, like you just said it so naturally because it's just like, yeah. you know, it's like the, I really think that's going to be the intro, but, um, <laughs> but I'm really excited to have you here. I feel like, I feel like the tables have turned because I remember 
when we were doing a lot of market research when we first launched Pegasus two years ago, actually right before, I was curious about what were the other technologies out there and what are other, the other publications out there that are talking about them. And the tech equestrian, which is Juliana's blog, is <laughs> the only one that talks about that. So I'm glad that now I'm asking, we're, we're asking you the questions. Yeah. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> so thanks for, thanks for yeah. joining us this morning. Sure. And on that note, uh, do you want to give the audience just a quick one minute summary of who you are and what you do? Sure, I'm happy to do that. So um, hi, everyone. Thanks again for listening. My name is Juliana Chapman. I am the founder and creator of the Tech Equestrian which is a horse tech blog um, that's focused on all the latest um, technology that's coming into the horse world, along with and you know parts of the equestrian lifestyle. So what goes with that? Um, because as we know, it's an it's an entire experience and it's an it's a journey. Um, I do have an extensive history of working in the technology field um, on the marketing side. I've also been riding since I was 10. Uh, I also have written children's novels all about the environment. Um, so I feel that the blog kind of um, pulls together a lot of the strengths that I offer, which is writing, writing, and technology. So that's, it kind of just dovetailed nicely. I had the idea about five years ago, um, you know, the, the horse world is a little behind the curve when it comes to technology adoption. So I did wait um, a few years. However, you know, I, I started seeing things early on, um, but it's been exciting and I'm really, um, you know, focused on what's to come and really preparing people for all the opportunities that technology can give to yourself as an equestrian and to your horse. So, yeah, so that's my background um, in a nutshell. Right. And, and so how many, I mean, you, how many years did you say you've been writing it for the blog? Um, so I am on year three. Right. Um, and, and for our listeners in the event that they're listening to this and they want to go check it out while they are listening, what's the, uh, where can they, what's the address for the blog? Sure. So the web address is the tech equestrian.com. That's pretty easy. <laughs> right. Right. So, so, I mean, I suppose the obvious question is why tech? I mean, it's, you know, the equestrian world is a, uh, is a, I mean, I, it's obvious why equestrian, because you've been writing since you were 10, but okay. why technology? I mean, of all things that you can focus on, why did you, you know, focus on technology in the equestrian space? So first and foremost, you know, I've been exposed to technology through my, my corporate uh, background, through my experience. And I noticed it, uh, technology kind of going into the sports world, you know, many, many years ago. And I thought, well, if that's happening, we know how expensive horses are. Why would you not spend the time and money and energy looking into how technology can help that whole engagement and ownership of a horse? Um, and even performance. So for high level performers or even, you know, local shows, you know, how can you improve? I think technology gives us that tool of improving uh, a range of things. So, um, so it just, I started you know, doing some research, leveraging the internet, leveraging social media. And I did start seeing some early forms of, you know, barn management software and, and apps, obviously apps are where we're at. And apps actually dovetail nicely into the horse world because it's mobile. You know, we are always out at the barn, we're riding, we're going to a show, we're, we're, we're very mobile. Like we're not really tied to a desk. So yeah. apps just are a nice way to kind of help bring technology into the horse world a little easier. Yeah. Um, so it just, it, and everything in our consumer world obviously we're very, you know, pretty digitally savvy, especially the young uh, equestrians these days are, they were born with cell phones, you know, so they're very used to having everything at their fingertips. So it just makes sense that that world is going to, you know, sync nicely with the horse world. Yeah. It's, it's, we say this a lot because when we speak to, you know, um, in the line of work with Pegasus, when we speak to other equestrians or we speak to uh, business people who are trying to understand the equestrian space, you know, 
the common expression you hear, especially amongst, you know, lifelong equestrians is like, oh, I don't like technology, like it's technology and me, we don't go together. Like, I don't like using software, blah, 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 blah. But the thing that like we always struggle to understand is like, yes, but they are on Facebook like all the time. Like right, whether it's right. in a blog, whether it's in a Facebook group selling a saddle or it's in another group like complaining about this or whether it's in another group like giving their like writing tips on that. So mm -hmm. there seems to be, I don't know if this has been your experience, but we have found that in the equestrian community, there's like this discourse mm -hmm. where in their personal life, whether it be like talking with friends and family and stuff, like they are all very tech savvy. But mm -hmm. if you ask them to apply tech to their workspace, which is the equestrian space, they like forget that and they think that they don't know technology well, so and they complain about technology in the workspace. Uh, well, I don't know if it's, okay, agreed. We do talk about this obviously a lot yeah. as we are <laughs> developing a tech company in the equestrian space. But it, my theory is that there's a lot of technology out there that is either not a good user experience. So it's cumbersome for the rider, for the person to go through and navigate it, or it's just not solving a, a challenge. It's not, it's not actually providing value that the person feels the need to download and learn and go through it. It's, it's easier for them to just utilize Excel. So those are my, those are my two theories on why it's such a hard thing to adopt yeah. and get, and get past that, that well, uh, barrier. Well, for Julia, as, as you spend your life, uh, interviewing uh, technology company, question technology company uh, founders and uh, business leaders. Have, has that same thing, has that conversation come up like online or yeah. offline? And, yeah. and what, and what, you know, you, you're in this very fortunate, like, so from a, as a business, as a businessman, as opposed to, you know, a technology guy, the thing that's most valuable about your blog and where like you've really managed to carve out a space for yourself in the ecosystem is that as the single journalist who seems to be uh, making technology in this space your niche, you have the conversations with everyone. So you are in a position to see the entire market in the same way that a consultant from like McKinsey or PwC goes into lots of offices and sees the entire market and sees what all the businesses are doing. So you're in a very good position to have an umbrella perspective of the challenges of tech adoption in the mm -hmm. equestrian space. You know, what works, what doesn't work, you know, how the market feels about it. So on that line, like this is our been our experience that we have found mm -hmm. that, you know, Jen thinks it's a UX experience. I think it's a cultural problem. What has mm -hmm. been your experience having spoken to other companies that are trying to get people to buy or use their technology? Yeah, great question. Um, this is a really, really interesting topic and it's something that's going to evolve and I'm starting to see it more and more. So there's two things that are happening is Jen, you touched on it. It's the user experience. So when I talk to all of the horse tech vendors, I say, you know, what do you do to, you know, what's the latest and greatest, what are you doing to improve your product or service? Um, and they, most of them say, we are always outreaching to our communities and getting feedback. So that whole uh, feedback loop is critical to success. And you really need, you know, you need champions, whether it's trainers, riders, owners, um, you know, your uh, spectators, you need champions for your product or service to say, this is easy to use. This is how I use it. Um, this is the value I get out of it. It's easier said than done, obviously. Um, but that is a that is a critical piece is constantly improving that experience. Um, and that can be applied to our consumer world as well, because I think we all have our challenges when we're on an app or on a website and we're like, oh, why isn't this working? Um, so there's that. Um, and then also with the equestrian world, we have a very, very strong influencer in the way of a trainer. Um, so I don't know, you know, a lot of people that take lessons, uh, you know, I always ask my trainer for advice and if they're not into technology, if they don't feel comfortable with it, that's a big hurdle. So it's yeah. almost like, how do these tech horse tech companies work through that? Do they need to have a workshop with the trainers? Do they need to have a workshop with the owners, um, with the students? So I think they're, I think that is very unique to our world um, is that trainer influence. Um, and I think we're starting to see a little bit of, you know, the riders being more of the brand champions. 
um but it's it's been slow it's slow going yeah so it's um, a really interesting point about the trainers as yeah. to your first point about getting feedback from users in the market mm -hmm. so like I, I agree that that's crucially important um, but, you know, like just in our own market research, we look at other, you know, equestrian technology that's out there. And I also think that, um, and I think this comes from, I think this comes from either inexperience or over eagerness to please the customer or, um, you know, or more of a like coming from a older school of thought or an older um, experience set in the technology space. Mm -hmm. But I also think a lot of equestrian uh, technology platforms, as they spend so much time talking to the customer, they just add feature and they add feature and they add feature and they add feature. And then yeah. you look, open it and you have no idea how to do anything. You're like, where, like, what are all these tabs? What are all these buttons? And it just seems yeah. to be added. You click the drop down list mm -hmm. and it's just a million things you can do. And it actually like, I think detracts from the user experience. Like we talk about this a lot as we've been designing our technology is like, how do people actually use technology? And like for me, I'm, I'm a huge believer that people prefer single service apps as mm -hmm. opposed to an app that does everything. So like, like <laughs> if, I, 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 if I could order an Uber in Facebook, I would still use the Uber app because it's mm -hmm. easier for me from the moment I unlock my phone to press right, the right. black button and know that, that gets me a car as opposed to having to open, right. the, blue button, open the blue app, navigate to a menu, find the ride share part and then order an Uber. Well, I think it depends on what's happening within the realm of what the technology company is. For example, on Facebook, they have apparently dating and there's just, I don't even know what all is on Facebook at the yeah. moment, but Uber, for example, has, you can get it, you can get a car, you can get food. They've got a bunch of, you can get scooters. So it's within the realm of mobility so that you're you're willing yeah. to play with these different features within Uber. Whereas Facebook, it's like, hold on, I thought this was just like being able to upload yeah. photos, et cetera. But that's my point. Like as in human yeah. beings, it's human nature. We have identified that the black app is for mobility. And even mm -hmm. if it could do a lot more, we don't like that. Like we want to open, like, like our user experience starts at the moment you unlock the phone and we look mm -hmm. for the black button to get the car. Right, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, we like it that way. We like it that simple. And it's almost, it's almost like your, the user experience for an app doesn't start the moment they open the app. It opens the, mo it starts the moment they open the phone and having to go into an app to then navigate to the mobility part of that app is just one more step than opening the mobility app from the very start. Yeah. Well, well, going to, because as Sam said, you kind of are this umbrella of being able to see all the different types of technologies and things that are being developed. So are there certain things that on Sam's point where it, it's, it's covering a certain theme really well, you don't have to talk about certain companies, but maybe there's something in horse management or in, um, I don't know, stable management or, or what, whatever it might be that is a theme that is actually being done really well and people are adopting because it all kind of, the ecosystem all works or is that yeah, something I mean, you still haven't seen yet? Yes. Yeah, so there's, again, there's probably a few factors that are, that are bubbling up with these horse tech companies. I'm going to use a horse phrase we, we know pretty well in the horse racing world. They're kind of jockeying for position, right? Because they don't, they're not making a lot of money, if at all. <laughs> yeah. So they're trying to figure out, so adding these features, they're trying to figure out what's going to stick. Where can they make money? Where can they bring value? And because the market's still in that early adoption phase, you know, it, they got to, they have to figure out, but I agree, uh, Sam, I think they need to crawl before they can walk. I think there, yeah. there are some that, that want to take on the world. And I, you know, I sit there and I listen and I nod and I'm like, yeah, that, you know, 90% of you want to take on the world and offer all these solutions, but you really do need to find your niche. And there are a bunch of horse, uh, horse tech apps. Um, there is like the, the Uber of the horse tech world. There's the Tinder of the horse tech world. Like there are people that are starting to create these um, channels of influence and value that that we see in the consumer world. And it's and yeah. it's a one stop shop just for that solution, just for buying and selling a horse. I'm going to go here. Um, I'm going to bring my horse. I'm going to go on my app, and I need to get my horse from Wellington to the Northeast. 
So I know where to do that. So yeah. you know, like there are, they're, they're starting to, to come to light these um, strong performers that I think will make, make the difference out there. It's a really interesting point too, you made about the trainers, which is that, mm-hmm. you know, so much of uh, your experience with horses is under the guidance of or the direct administration of the trainer. Like, you know, it's very, depending on what sport you're in, but like in the hunter jumper world, for example, it's very, Mm -hmm. very common that the trainer does all your paperwork to register for an event and takes care of all the payments. In the eventing Mm -hmm. world, it's a bit more like the individual competitors take responsibility for their own admin. But if you're trying to build a technology platform that makes life easier for an exhibitor, but the exhibitor is actually not using the technology and it's all been done by, you know, the trainers, et cetera, mm-hmm. then yeah, it, it, it complicates things. Is that, is that, a, is that, I mean, whether you've had that conversation online or offline with other um, tech companies, is that, is that something that has been discussed and they've like, you know, they've been struggling with, like, how do we overcome this hurdle that, this, that the trainers have a grip on who does what and when? Yeah, that definitely has come up. I do emphasize that, that they need to build that influencer base. I don't think it's easy at all um, because we're kind of in that middle stage of a lot of the trainers are 50 plus, or I'll give them maybe 45 plus in age. And they're still, you know, and, and again, the horse world is unique because horses need consistency, right? They, everybody kind of has their way to do things. Change is very hard because in their mind, they're like, well, horses don't like change. I don't want to cause too many issues with change because it might hinder the horse, hinder the rider. I don't want to self, I don't want, you know, my trainer doesn't allow me to have a cell phone on me at all. Or even like, uh, you know, having it in the barn is kind of like, whoa, what are you doing? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, they don't want noise around horses because they've heard of issues where somebody got hurt or fell or what have you. So again, it's that older mindset of I've done it this way for so long and it's worked. Why am I adding this element of technology? Yeah. It's like the adopter Um, trainers opinion and they're, they might be online learning more about it, but they're perhaps a little bit hesitant to adopt something that they've learned because that could go against what they've been told, what they've been, what their trainer has told them for the last five years. I mean, and there are apps out there that allow you to download sessions from other trainers. So that's competitive, right? Why would they allow their student to do that? (laughs) Yeah. Right. Right. And so have, have you seen, have you seen any effective strategies to overcome this this hurdle? Yeah. For the influencers and, and getting in front of the trainers, it, it really is. It's difficult because the trainers aren't using social media that much. They're mainly at horse shows and because of the pandemic, you know, that's been kind of offline for two years. Um, so I think being at a show, you need that face to face with them. Um, so I think horse shows are the way to go events. Um, word of mouth, you know, kind of more of an old school marketing approach would work. Um, but th- it's changing because the trainers are getting younger right? Yeah. and we are seeing more of an openness. Um, and the good news about the apps that do have the trainers that give um, lessons online and you can actually hear them when you ride, um, it, al- it actually gives those older trainers another avenue of, of revenue. So they're sort of opening up to, okay, well, tech can give me this mm-hmm. ability to yeah. act a bigger audience I've ever, never had before. Yeah. Like anything, if you help them make some money or save some money, it's a pretty big, uh, pretty big uh, incentive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for the ones, cause you had said that there are some that are like the Uber of the horse world, you know, et cetera. What would you say the ones that are sticking, what are they doing right that is facilitating that sticking? Do you think it's the user experience or the marketing or just good product? Where would you? Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a combination. Um, really good question. It's a combination of a product that's been around for at least five years. Um, however, I say that there's some new ones that just came on the scene within the last two years that are that look really solid. Um, and it's um, and a lot of these successful horse tech companies have a really solid network 
of either trainers, riders, owners, people that are aware, or, you know, yeah, top uh, riders. So uh, within their disciplines, but, you know, and, and then just having that social media presence, because you want to meet the young riders as they're up and coming. I mean, I go to horse shows and everybody's head is in their phone. If they're not riding, they're like, you know, they're on their Yeah, phones. This is what I talk about when I say there's a discourse. Like, yeah. they're like, oh, I don't like technology. But <laughs> like, but in between the rounds, like I'm on Facebook because I'm using mm -hmm. it for my personal life, but exactly. I don't like technology for work. And it, and, but it's not even like, it's, it's so often the comment, it's not even like, I don't like technology. It's like, oh, I'm not good at it. Right. But I use Facebook hours a day. Exactly. It's it's not like, good. <laughs> I think, I think it needs to be solving a problem. Like mm -hmm. first and foremost, like yeah. things that are kind of nice to have like another to do app. I mean, it doesn't really stick. So it needs mm -hmm. to, it needs to solve an actual problem and it needs to have a really good user experience. And to your point too, Juliana, when you have a network and you have like, say a, a social media influence and you know, mm -hmm. all the top hundred jumper trainers on mm -hmm. the East coast, it's easier for them to promote that. Just like any celebrity who's launching a product is going to be able to get that stickiness. Yeah you know, yep. immediately right away. So then, it, and so it could be something that's solving a problem, but maybe it's not the right time. There, there's not enough marketing behind it. So I think that just all those little elements, that, my opinion can make for a successful launch and yeah. adoption. I, I think the other thing too is, and you know, this is kind of the same point, but a bit different is that people ride horses because they want to get away from technology. Like sure. that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so like for yeah. us with like, we've been successful in growing this podcast audience, mm -hmm. but it hasn't been easy. And it's been harder than I would say that a lot of podcasts, like, you know, so I personally, outside of this, I listen to a lot of technology podcasts as, you know, mm -hmm. CTO of Pegasus, I've got to make sure that I'm educated and up to date on things. Yep. And their audience are people who like wake up excited to listen to podcasts about technology. Like, and it would make total sense to me that in the equestrian space, like, oh, you know, a podcast would be an excellent medium. Like you spend a lot of time a day doing chores. We need to be outside physically involved. You need your hands free. So a podcast where you can put AirPods in or whatever, and just learn about the equestrian space and go about your business. It's a no brainer, but no, it's not the case because a lot of equestrians are like, I don't want to listen to anything. I'm outside. This is my time off. Or, so, or, like, <laughs> but, or, or they're driving from, you know, New York down to Wellington. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we listen to music. Like music for mm. 15 hours. <laughs> That's it? Watching porn? Um, yeah. So I suppose, I suppose my point is, is that like, I think, I think, um, I think the B2B space in the equestrian world mm -hmm. is easier than the B2C space. I think. Agreed. But yeah. I mean, have you found that? I mean, like, so, you know, some of the apps you've talked about, like the Tinder for horses, for et cetera, like, uh, I think we know the one you're talking about. I'd be really yeah. interested to see how that goes yeah. because it's going to be a perfect example. Like, I'd be interested to see how it goes in two cents. One is, um, is it successful? Is it able to take off? Like, can they prove the model right? Because I mean, a lot of the people using it, if they are, you know, are already used to the user experience. Like it's the same as Tinder and a lot of these people are on Tinder. So like, you know, it's an right. easy, it's an easy adoption. Mm -hmm. But I'll be interested to see more importantly is are the people who are using it like competitors, exhibitors, horse lovers, or is it gonna be an app that becomes things trainers use to find horses, to sell to their students, their exhibitors, right. their things. And I, so I don't, I'm not quite sure yet if it's a B2C mm -hmm. or a B2B app and I, like, I mean, just to say like, it'll be a good indicator of like, what is easier in the equestrian world when it comes to technology to sell direct, direct to the consumer or whether it is ultimately a B2B space. Yeah, yeah. and Sam, that's really interesting because there are about, that I've seen about five buying and selling apps that are out there and they're all starting to have their niche. Like there's one that's based over in Europe and they're just doing sport horses. So they're building their, based on their background and their network of, you know, top level world-class trainers and riders, that's what they're doing. That's what they're focused on. Yeah. And I think they're having pretty good success with that. And they do amazing work on social, 
Um, and they're using a lot of video. That's another thing that I would add. Video is where it's at. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I watch reels on Instagram and I just get into that mode of reels and I love them. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we I'll are very guilty of that too. Yeah, <laughs> It's really funny. Anyway. We'll go through Sam's and it's like fitness and I don't know, really funny stuff. Mine's just like cooking and dogs and horses <laughs> over right. and over. Anyway, I digress. But then there are other apps that, um, Sam, the one I just mentioned, the Tinder one, you're right. I think they're trying to figure out where, what's going to work for them and, and who's going to be the early adopters and who's going to really make them the money. Um, I think it's exciting. I'm really, I'm psyched to see where it goes. Um, because I think there is so much potential there because the alternative is going on to a website and clicking all your filters and then waiting for the email or trying to figure out which horse you like. It, it's just very cumbersome. You know, it's yeah. not, it's not easy, like an app or yeah. something that's fashioned after a Tinder app. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think there is, and, and I say this to if you're listening to this podcast and you are a trainer i say this more as like as something to consider as opposed to like you know the the world is ending but i think there is in the equestrian space a a point approaching probably in the next five to ten years there's going to be a showdown between technology and trainers like it's the trainers as for so long have had you know the like a controlling stake, a controlling stake in the ecosystem yeah. Yeah. But the more and more apps make it easier for individual horse owners and competitors to do a lot of their work without mm -hmm. the trainer's uh, requirement. I think there's going like the trainer will be still very, very important for training. But I think there, I think there is going to be a relinquish of control in some mm -hmm. spaces. And the perfect example of that, you know, will be horse sales. Like, yes. you know, at the moment, trainers have an absolute stranglehold on the buying and yep. selling of horses and that's where they make the majority of their money and you know kudos to them but the more tinder apps come available when someone can sit on a couch and be like just swipe through horses um you know if they get attached to a horse that they come across and they want it mm -hmm. and then the trainer tries to talk them out of it because the trainer doesn't have the ability to go and secure that horse for them then they're gonna have a problem and i think so i think it's something that like if i was a trainer listening to this i'd be rather than fighting technology like it's always better to be the uh the stakeholder in the market that's like okay how do i get in early and control this new domain and and carve out my control and my ability to thrive in this new environment as opposed to resisting it and then just being left behind i love that and it's actually something i've spoken about before in a webinar i was on last year um if you own a stable, if you own a large barn operation as a trainer, trying to you know get new clients, new customers, technology will be the differentiator down the road. Maybe not tomorrow, but probably in two or three years. The reason I say that is because not only is it training. So say I bought one of those, um, the ride tracking cameras. So every time you have a lesson, I'm gonna send you a video. Yeah. That's going to make me stand out from other trainers. Well, my yeah. other trainer doesn't do that. Yeah, so then the other thing is have. safety and, and vet, you know, working with a digital vet, um, the safety of the, the barn, there shouldn't be any fires anymore in barns. There should be cameras. There should be devices that track any, any substance that's different in the environment. I mean, again, technology, it's not just for the enhancement of the rider, it's also for the, the horse's care and the safety on the overall environment that horses live in. Yeah, And it's everything from feeding, like automatic feeders to, um, so I talked about the vet. There are wearable devices now that horses can have on them. So when the vet comes and checks on them, they react one way, but when the vet leaves, they can audit, they can track exactly the heart rate, you know, how they're yeah. performing. I mean, it, it's just mind blowing what's so, out there. Yeah, so really good point. And I, and I do want to come back to that in one second, okay. just to finish this off, this train <laughs> of things. I, I just thought of something really interesting, like an interesting <laughs> point. Yeah. So we have a friend who is a trainer um, and like trainers, 
in my experience, and again, I'm new to the equestrian space. I'm not a lifelong equestrian. So take this, you know, as you, you listen to this as you see fit. And, you know, if you think I don't know what I'm talking about, then fair enough. But, um, but we have a trainer who is, he's more of a, I would say a trainer who thinks like a business person, as opposed to a trainer who loves to train horses and make some money on the side by finding horses for their students and selling them. Right. So I think there is a mindset change. And this is where I think trainers who are resisting technology, so someone just hasn't sat them down and been like, you shouldn't be resisting this because you don't like change. You should be like excited about the opportunity because the trainer that we know, they're like, oh, technology has given me the ability to scale my operations drastically. Like before I have to, I had to go to Europe three or four times a year. I had to fly over there. I, I had to raise money from investors mm -hmm. to give me a pot of cash and then I would fly over to Europe and then I would meet up with a fixes, like some agents on the ground in Europe and they would take me around to their network of horses. And then I would buy the horses. The person on the ground in Europe would take their cut of it and, you know, for helping me find the horse and then I'd fly them back to America. And I'd spend three months, you know, getting the, finding out where the horse, what discipline the horse should be in and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I would sell them. And they would make good money, but there was a lot of work involved. There was a lot of overhead. There were a lot of middlemen in the, in the path. Mm -hmm. And that's the way trainers traditionally do the buying and selling of horses. And now he's like, I've just completely shifted my model. He goes, now I basically have like a couple staff. We sit in a room with computers. We look at all the horses available across Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. the different apps. And mm -hmm. we basically run this like an agency that sits in a room and buys and sells the horses that way. And they've been able to like raising money from investors, like it's much easier to sell. So they uh, get, it's easier to raise money. They yeah. are increasing how many horses they're able to buy and sell mm -hmm. and Find drastically the scale. And they're making a fortune. And oh, it's yeah. just like, it's like, that's a different way of looking at it. I mean, still mm -hmm. train people because that's what you love. If you love being out in the field, but it's a much better use of your time and you're going to get a much uh, more mm -hmm. income if you actually embrace technology and use it as opposed to trying to fight it. Yeah, well, he's more of like a horse agent. So I see what you're saying, Juliana, with if you have, if you're a trainer that's not necessarily sourcing horses, but your entire business model is based on bringing horses to your barn and taking really good care of them and making sure that they're safe and healthy, happy, have, it's almost like a night, a really nice apartment where it's secure and it's yeah. safe. It's got Very all good. those amenities yeah. that make you stand out from just the boarding barn at the same price mm -hmm. down the street. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. So I'm talking about technology for like buying and selling agents. horses yeah. and agents and stuff. Right. Yeah. But then, as you said, like, so that's like, that side of the equation. Mm -hmm. But then to your point, like technology is not just software. So, right. you know, there's, a, have you interviewed a lot of companies that are doing, you know, hardware in, in the tech world, they call it atoms and atoms versus bits. So <laughs> bits is software. Atoms is like hardware. Um, like matter. Yeah. So like what, what are the trends you've seen? You know, what are the trends you've seen in terms of atoms, in terms of the hardware coming to market that people can use in the equestrian space? So the hardware is more in terms of you've heard the word wearables. Yeah. So those are the smaller um, AI type sensor devices that either they either snap onto the girth or there is like a strap that goes with it and it sits within the strap and it goes around the belly of the horse. So then it, so there's two things it can do. It obviously either tracks the, the heart rate, the amount of oxygen that the horse is breathing. So it gives you that baseline of, you know, are they, are they working really hard or not working that hard at all? And then it gives you benchmarks based on that. I think it's brilliant. So figure that out. And then on the veterinary side, if your horse is like having colic issues or, or ulcer or what have you, it will, it will track other types of um, ways of how they are either doing better or not doing better at all. So it gives the vet those, again, based on the benchmark, it gives them the, the ability to figure out what's happening when the vet's not in the stall, when, you know, it's, it's 24 seven, it's tracking it. Yeah. Are you seeing a high adoption of that? It's, I mean, with, with people, right. We've got 
our our Apple watches, you have the whoop band. I mean, there's so many things that we are tracking our own fitness internally. Right. And for the horse, it's like you just, you know, you you go off of the experience of yourself, your trainer, knowing the horse to know how much you're pushing them, but there's been no real proper data. Mm -hmm. I personally don't own my own horse at the moment, um, but I would imagine that if I did and I'm trying to get to a certain point in my training and get to a certain level, I would want all the gadgets mm -hmm. as, as much as possible, as the ones that are working to track their fitness as much as I'm tracking mine. Sure. So do you see, um, cause yeah, like, like I said, I don't, I don't have my own horse, so I don't have a need to buy these things, but are mm -hmm. you seeing that those types of technologies are indeed taking off? So the ride tracking, the devices that you put on the girth just to track overall performance, it's, it's pockets. I'm not seeing a lot of it. Um, it's really not commonplace yet. There was a product on the market a few years ago and because of the pandemic, they're no longer. Um, so I think it's still early days. On the veterinary side, I think there's more adoption, but I think it still suffers from, I'm gonna call it trainer syndrome because a lot of the vets are older, right? And they're not used to this kind of stuff. Mm. So they're always, they're like, what's this going to do? What, you know, I have to yeah. invest in this. This is going to affect my bottom line. So this there's is a lot of the same <laughs> themes yeah. that go from each of these products and services. I, mean, I think yeah. that's just such a huge, well, especially because each trainer probably has their own opinion on what's good, what's bad. Honestly, even what's lame or not. I don't know if you mm -hmm. saw this recent video that surfaced on, uh, it, I think it started off on an activist page and then it kind of like went, it, it took off, it went viral. And it was essentially this, this trainer had published a video of her student and apparently the horse was very visibly lame. And then mm -hmm. in the comments, it was like, well, is the horse lame? Is the horse not lame? And, you know, just it, horse people, I mean, it, it, it became a very large discussion. Yeah, and yeah. so I would imagine that there's a huge space where it's just, you know, you put a device on a horse and maybe it tracks the movement, it tracks its mm -hmm. breathing, it tracks even like, or it, it tracks some type of pain threshold. Mm -hmm. And I'm by no means a vet, but being able to capture on no, this, this horse is objectively uncomfortable mm -hmm. versus it being at the discretion of the trainer's opinion right. of it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely, that's what I love about these products. It, it gives us the information. Obviously the horse can't tell us what's going on. So it gives us that insight we never had before. Um, however, saying that you have to know how to read that data. And we see that in the consumer world. Like when you when you're running and you look at all your stats, you're like, that's great, but are you really taking the time to figure out what's going on? Mm -hmm. So it gets back to the user experience and educating the consumer as to what the value they're gonna get out of it. Yeah. So I think I, that's, that's the hard part. We were laughing about this the other day because like I obsessively track my, uh, every day I look at my like, my resting heart rate, my heart rate mm -hmm. variability and all this sort of stuff. And I ignore it every single time except mm -hmm for when I don't want to work out and it tells me I should rest, I'm like, okay, I won't work out today. <laughs> like, uh, I, I would love to work out, but you know, the data is telling me I shouldn't. That's the only time ever that I listen to it. Like, otherwise I just like, I look at it. I, it's good to know, but I completely ignore it and I move on. <laughs> but imagine having that for a horse where it's like, no, your horse like really needs a rest day. You wanted to ride today, but your horse based on the data, mm. like it, it'll, it'll perform better tomorrow if you give the horse the day off today yeah. so i don't know i'm i'm by no means like a, a scientist and a hardware developer but being able to put the two together i think that's a huge market actually this just came to me at the top of my head but we did a uh, interview um uh, a few months back with a guy called Efa who runs the equestrian fitness academy and mm -hmm. that podcast for anyone who's interested in listening to it is all about like we we've always been surprised at the lack of influencers on instagram who are creating fitness programs for equestrians and like stretching and, and you know, and strength building uh, programs, considering that it's a very physical sport. Uh, there's basically fitness people in every vertical in the planet and the, the equestrian world doesn't seem to have them. Um, but Aoife is going in that direction and he's trying to build out a program. But if you had the ability as a fitness, if you could integrate like your Apple watch data mm. with like the equestrian, uh, the horse, 
uh, rest the data. Yeah. And it was basically like, look, your horse needs a rest day today. This is the perfect day for you to go and do your mm -hmm. work on you, the rider, and do your clean your tech, clean your yeah. tech, etc. <laughs> or like, or like, do some stretching in the barn, or like, go do a strength day, etc. If you could like synchronize the horse's rest days with your workout days, yeah. that could be effective. Yeah. See. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. That yeah, would be great. Together. And I'm sure it's doable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the note of atoms versus bits, um, have you have you been have you been able to identify whether you think hardware is selling more or less or being adopted at faster rates than software? Like if you had to back one camp, you know, software in the question space versus hardware in the question space, which one seems to be getting more traction? as a big vertical? Uh, definitely software. Really? So I would yeah. have thought it'd be the opposite. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, so why do you think that is? Do you think it's, do you think there's more adoption of it? Like there's just a lot more pr products. There's more an, more of an offering of software. So therefore there's a lot happening and there's maybe not as much happening definitely. in hardware yeah. yet. No, you, yeah, you nailed it. Um, there's a lot of variety. There's, it's easier to find the value out of it. It's um, not as cost prohibitive um, as some of the hardware issues. <laughs> speaking you know, of which. Speaking of hardware, I'm having an yeah. issue with my mic right now. So, yeah, so that's what I'm seeing, definitely. So, but, that, but that's the actual build. Like, are you saying it's it's too expensive to buy the hardware if you're a a, a consumer? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I, right. Oh, point. so it's cost prohibitive at the moment, where it's easier to just download another app and do the freemium exactly. model, which most of them probably are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Have you noticed a difference in um, the sort of people creating software companies versus the sort of people creating equestrian hardware companies? Yes. Um, so uh, more on the software side, it's just easier to come to market, right? So if you have an idea that the infrastructure and the ecosystem out there, there's tons of developers that are available to help you with whatever your needs are. When it comes to hardware, there's, I feel there's a lot more uh, research time that you have to uh, have a prototype, um, especially with, you know, horses, depending on where, you know, which market you're looking at to help horses or equestrians. So I just think there's more time invested. Um, you know, a lot of the digital vet uh, products, they're, they've spent a lot of time and money working through the kinks. And I, I don't think that's for everybody. Uh, I think right. it's a lot harder. Yeah, because yeah, I, I, the reason I asked that is like, off the top of my head, my hypothesis would be that the hardware companies are being started by seasoned technical experts in the space. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, the hardware companies for the horse rate monitors and horse rate monitors, et cetera. I'm sure that they are like veterinarians who saw an opportunity, raised some money or bootstrapped it, found and built software and hardware to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Where I feel like the software is probably, there's probably an increasing amount of people going into the software space of just like, I love horses, but I also want to start a tech company sort exactly. of thing. Mm -hmm. You yes. know what I mean? Like yes. they're not, they're not, yep, yep. They're not career experts in the field. They're, they're young people who want to have a modern white collar tech job, mm -hmm. but pa horses are their passion. Yeah, exactly. And there, and the cool part is there's plenty of people that can help you get to where you need to be. There's so many, like a lot of the horse tech vendors that I interview that have apps, they're like, oh yeah, we outsource our developers. We outsource this. We, we work with these people because they're experts in this. So there, again, there's more of an ecosystem to help them get it to market quicker and hopefully make money sooner. <laughs> you have your own horse, right? Um, I'm leasing. You're leasing. Okay. Yeah. Cause yeah. I was, I was curious just going, you know, with, with the hardware, I, I've, I'm so embedded in the software that mm -hmm. thinking about the hardware and what people are using is fascinating. So uh, with your barn, with your horse that you're leasing, are mm -hmm. there technologies that they're adopting at that barn, especially you as, you know, basically like a really great objective tech consultant are you bringing some of those to the barn um i i do a little bit but again um because the trainer owns the horse you know there's only so much adoption that they're open to <laughs> so, yeah read my blog uh, read lightly <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a perfect example of the problem of the industry though isn't it yep. it's like, it is. it's it like really is. E yeah. even even the one person in the industry who goes out of their way <laughs> to interview everyone in tech can't get their trainer to exactly. adopt technology, yeah. 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 Well, 
Well, I, I want to talk more about your blog because okay. <laughs> I, I think it's an amazing resource. So Thank like you. I said when, in the beginning, when we first, before we launched Pegasus, we were doing a ton of market research to see mm -hmm. what we're looking to build. Is it on the market? I mean, as I hope, hopefully any company before they launch will do. And mm -hmm. your website is such a great resource because it, it has pretty much every technology in equestrian space that you can think of with links, with interviews. So yeah, let, let's, uh, I guess like taking a step back, I know you started it three years ago, but can you, and, and, and why you started it? Because you combined all passions into one, but like, what would you say is the, like the mission? Where are you going with it? What are you looking to grow, grow into in the next you know, yeah. three years? Yes. Um, so my mission and my purpose is really building out the awareness of technology in the horse world, um, where it's gone, where it's present day and future. Um, I just feel like the more we can um, embrace the technology, it's going to give us a lot of advantages in every aspect of riding. Um, I would love to hopefully in the next few years is maybe create some type of a, a venue or a place that people can meet and discuss all of these great um, advancements in the tech world. Um, so whether that's, um, you know, a conference or a summit or, or part of a speech at a large trade show, you know, some way to bring that awareness full circle, I think would be so amazing and powerful. Um, but again, I'm um, of the notion that the more you can learn, the more you're gonna succeed in all aspects of your life. And I think it's just gonna be more fulfilling um, if you can adopt some of this tech, um, and it's, it's something that we live and breathe in our consumer world. So it makes perfect sense to bring it over to the horse world. Um, but I just get so jazzed with interviewing the horse tech providers, understanding where they're coming from. I mean, everybody has a, a different way of approaching it, which is great. Um, so I love that. I love to see the passion on their side too, because we're all in this together. I mean, in the horse world, as we know, there's so many disciplines, right? There's English, endurance, Western, just everything. But we have the one core focus of the horse that unites us all. So why not kind of have technology help in that aspect as well? Um, so it's, it's just a really exciting time to be a part of this. And I, I can't wait to see it kind of build from there. And I, you know, the more we can get adopters and people um, kind of sharing their experiences, um, Sam, like the, the trainer that you talked about, the agent who leverages technology and his, his, you know, it's impacting his business in a positive way. That's yeah, kind of absolutely. where we need to get to. We need more, we need more evangelists like that out there. Yeah. yeah. And so many people, especially in the equestrian world, which is a little bit more like dated historically, there's so much more word of mouth. So to be able to have that event, to get everyone in the room, no matter if you're in the Western world or the English world or overseas, I mean, we've all, we've all encountered something, hopefully that has made our lives a little bit easier. And someone on the other side of the country might have no idea that this technology existed. So to be able to bring everyone together and talk about it, I think it's just going to make all of the question sport way more efficient and productive and happier and healthier. So uh, I'm glad you brought it up because I, I was, we were, we were before the podcast where we had obviously talked a bit about the idea of this conference and this event. So if there is anyone listening that also thinks this is a good idea and has the infrastructure <laughs> or has a vision for, you know, helping this come to fruition, definitely reach out to Juliana because this is something that I think would be a really great thing for the industry. And the other thing too, you just kind of made me think about is that I was going to ask you this earlier, but it ties in now. How have you noticed any difference in technology adoption or technology interest across the different disciplines? Ah, good question. Um, across the disciplines, I'm not as versed in the Western world, but based on the English world um, and when, what happened is over the last few years with the pandemic, tech adoption has gone up quite a bit. Um, and I've 
I know that only from my data on how many people are actually looking on my blog. And when I interview horse tech providers, they're starting to see a lot more engagement, a lot more subscribers across the board. Um, but I think, you know, again, we are all consumers. We live and breathe with tech every day. So I think it's pretty similar. I think the Western world's pretty similar to the English world um, when it comes to that. But again, you know, I think it would be great to do t- some type of a research or a study to uncover more and to see the, the differences. There probably are some unique little variables in there that would be really interesting to look at. But yeah. Um, but yeah, the pandemic really accelerated actually horse tech adoption in the horse world only because people wanted access. They wanted to feel connected, right? We were all kind of like, well, what's going on with my horse? I can't visit the barn or I can't have my lesson like I normally do. So maybe I can learn more. Maybe I can see what's happening. So really that's, you know, connecting through technology is kind of what, what spurred um, more people looking into not only, you know, my website, but other providers as well. Have you spoken to, um, any tech companies that are in the content creation or content management space? Content creation. Um, do you mean, I mean social other? media? No, I, I just mean in the sense of, and this is another thing that we've talked about at nauseum is what, what baffles me also about the horse world is the, um, the lack of the YouTube ecosystem of digestible content. Like most, most passions in this world, Mm -hmm. there is a healthy amount of YouTube creators out there who have created content that fills that need. And while there are people out there who actually have relatively large YouTube channels, like it's still very um, immature. I suppose mm-hmm. the best way of putting it, like it's it's just someone who ride horses, like oh, I'm gonna go for a ride today, and they, this is my barn, and here's Steve. You guys love Steve, and then they just like show what they do for the day. Whereas mm-hmm. if you go look at like the technology sector, like my uh, my background of like sport was like the CrossFit mm-hmm. sector, like the content is like it's they've got story arcs, like they follow news, they do news updates, like they talk about the industry at large, they. They, they put a huge amount of production effort into it. And based off their success, they, they hire staff that help them make even better quality videos mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff. Be- and the only reason it works is because there's a passionate audience who identifies with a topic they create content about. And there's few, there's few ecosystems of people on this planet that are more passionate than the horse community. So <laughs> there's a gap between like how passionate they are yeah. and the amount of content available for them to be able to digest and sink their teeth into on a daily basis. Sam, you're so, pressuring me to do that, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> like, so I, I just, I just, like, I, yes, there's a gap. I agree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and like, I guess what I'm wondering is like, have you come across any, you know, ambitious, excited young founders or content creators who are like, here's the gap, here's the problem. I'm going to solve it. Like, yeah, I think, I think they kind of fall into the camp that you just talked about where they're like, I'm at my barn. This is what I'm wearing. This is what my horse is eating. So it's more of that kind of a background and content than more educational. However, I see, you know, a lot of the horse publications, that's an opportunity for them to kind of build off that. I know there's a lot of you know, riding and training videos that are out there um, from, you know, there's, I think one of the publications has an on-demand service now. Mm. Um, Actually, there's a couple. Um, So that's exciting to see, but yeah, like for, you know, full, full full-blown content and more educational um, content, I think there is a gap. Yes. Yeah. And because so Sam's favorite sport is CrossFit. And Mm -hmm. I know Sam watches a lot. I know because I get the luxury of getting to listen to it when it's on the TV. But um, (laughs) so but there's lots of there's lots of CrossFit content Mm -hmm. out there. And so Sam, if you because it's your it's your passion when it comes to, you know, sports. So maybe you talk about what is it about the CrossFit content that you like that equestrians could adopt if there is someone listening that's like, yeah. oh, I want to create content, but 
you know, what do I, what do, what do people want to hear? What's interesting? So provide more context. Well, I mean, how long have you got? Um, Not that long. <laughs> make, make this snappy. Okay. So in a nutshell, I will say this. If there is someone listening to this podcast who is like, that's a really good idea. I want to go do that. Like take the time to study the CrossFit ecosystem. So CrossFit and I, I actually went and researched this because I, I was convinced they did it on purpose. Turns out they didn't do it on purpose. It was a happy accident. <laughs> um, but they essentially built this system whereby the CrossFit as a company went out and created their own documentaries about the CrossFit games. It's like creating a, imagine creating a documentary about the World Equestrian Games where like, and as a result of, and through the course of watching the actual events unfold, they also show like the background of the individual competitors and them training in their own gyms and working up to the games. Um, the result of that was they made it so beautiful and so sexy and so like, no, it's very human. Very it's, human. It's like you and know, you know the people, you know their partners. Yeah, you, you know where like, they come from. And then when it gets to the actual event in which they compete, you're like rooting for them. Like you're like you're invested in it. What it did was, it created it created celebrities, because people watch the things and they're like, oh god, who is this guy or who is this girl? And they would like find their Instagram page and they get all these followers, and that created celebrities. Now the impact of that was that these celebrities now had celebrity power and they could now go and get, raise sponsorship off their own back, which gave them the income they needed to quit working full time and train full time, right. which made them even better, which made the games even more impressive to watch. So it created this ecosystem where like influencers became a thing. Mm -hmm. And then off that, YouTube channels be like propped up all over the place because mm -hmm. they're like, well, people want to see more about these celebrities. So there are all these YouTube channels where like these YouTubers would go around and they train with the celebrities. They would watch them like go to the cafe and what they eat and what their diet is and how they maximize their routine to perform at the games. And these YouTubers, they became celebrities because everyone watched their YouTube channel. And like the whole, and then what happened was that the CrossFit games stopped making content because they didn't need to. They created this self-sufficient so money-making cool. economy of content Crazy. that was self-fulfilling and just blew out of control and just ultimately what it did was it recruited a shit ton of people into the mm -hmm. sport because I was so excited for it because there was so much content to watch. Even that, I tried it. Yeah, even Jen <laughs> only, tried only it a out. few times. But, yeah. you know. <laughs> but like, you know, and, and then and, and so like and like I look at this and I'm like, well, you know, the passion of the CrossFit community is, is exactly the same as the passion for the equestrian community, uh -huh. except it's probably one hundredth the size of the equestrian community and probably one tenth as passionate. So then someone needs to start building out that <laughs> ecosystem. And if you do, you'll be very successful. You'll make a lot of money, but more importantly, you'll make the sport grow and flourish. And, you know, Agreed. there's my, I hope that was too, I hope that was short enough. <laughs> But it was a good point for for being able to if someone is because you mentioned the the content creation and that's a whole market in itself and utilizing mm -hmm. the technology to create something really exquisite uh -huh. so it's like for the riders too like we know a lot of riders i'm sure everyone does where it's you know they they are doing it full-time but they still have a full-time job and they'd like the riding to become their full-time career so in this example, to be able to adopt the quote unquote CrossFit model where you're, you know, documenting it and making it really interesting to watch, mm -hmm. that's ultimately going to result in helping them make that their full-time job. So there you go. We can, we can loop in CrossFit yeah, here. Yeah, there we go. And Juliana, <laughs> CrossFit started as a WordPress blog. So you're a blog, you're at the start, you're perfectly positioned to do this if you want to take on the responsibility. <laughs> It'll just totally I'm consume so you for the next 20 years of your life, but you know. There we go. <laughs> we got to hire a staff. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I'm trying to, I'm gonna, we're going to edit this out. So we've covered just, I guess, off the, off the record to go back through and edit. So I, I, we've definitely covered a lot about what it is that mm -hmm. you're doing in, in the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. But I want to make sure, because there, there are a lot of points. Are there, are there, is there something else, another segment that you really want to dive into? Because I know we are, you know, with, with time and this leaf blower outside. <laughs> yeah. Did you want me to cover um, the wisdom for equestrian entrepreneurs? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so are we good? Yeah, yes, good. Uh, 
so as I mentioned before, you know, this is, and this is something that I, that I brought from my, my professional life is, you know, always be learning that as an entrepreneur, you know, making sure you, you're just ready to kind of tackle the, the problems and situations of today by staying up to date on what's current. Um, and there are a lot of great resources out there. You know, there's obviously publications, social media. Um, and I actually look for a lot of ideas outside of the equestrian world. Um, so if you're familiar with, um, and Sam, you mentioned this, the, the B2B space, you know, businesses buying to businesses. Um, we always look to the B2C world for ideas and we implement those, the ones that make sense into the B2B world. So it's the same type of thing is, is looking at both markets and learning from each. Um, and then really knowing your core mission as an entrepreneur, what are you trying to deliver? What's your value? So the company I used to work for, every large meeting that involved investors or just anybody within the company, we always started the presentation with our mission statement and it never really changed from year to year. Like we might tweak it a bit here and there, but really, and again, that just kind of centered everyone. So it helped us keep, keep forward, um, keep working towards that goal. Um, and it, it, it was just, and it was very unifying. So I think knowing your mission statement is critical as well. Um, and then just obviously that keeps you focused. Um, and then if there's something, the other cool thing about the mission statement, if there's something that you're doing that doesn't align with it, then stop doing it. Yeah. We can easily go off on tangents, right? Especially these days with technology kind of bringing us here and there. But if it's not aligning to what you're trying to deliver, then stop doing it. So sure. that's definitely, those are kind of some words of wisdom that I would follow. Yeah, I love it. How many of the uh, how many of the people that you've interviewed across the years have actually um, have actually followed these followed this wisdom or embodied this wisdom? There's probably a good, I'd say, of the fifty vendors, probably half of them follow that because they're a they're still viable, they're still learning, they're still improving, um, they're tweaking as they go along, but they they do have one solid focus. Um, so that's exciting. Yeah. So it's about on that note, so in the equestrian, in the technology space, you know, you have like, there, there is sort of like, there are a few different types of people who start companies. Um, but to put them into two basic categories, you've got people who are really experienced, have the problem, fed up with it, and then just decide, mm. fuck it, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to like, I'll solve this. <laughs> and then you have the person who has dreams of being a founder. Mm -hmm and mm -hmm. building the next big thing and they go all in and it becomes exactly it becomes everything they are they're almost they're almost a founder in search of a problem as opposed mm -hmm. to a problem who needs to build a solution right. so of all the people you of all the people you interviewed what percentage what percentage of people do you think are you know the founders versus are the experienced business people who are just trying to solve a problem so it's that's a great question because actually in this industry, it's probably 80% founders and 20% business. Really? Wow. I yeah. thought you were going to say the exact opposite. No, and you would think that, but if you look at a lot of my articles, you'll see that pretty much everybody's like founder, founder, but they don't have a ton of business background. Now there's a few outliers that do, and there's people that still are in the business world and are still doing their app and are still riding. Um, so they're balancing a lot but majority of them are very passionate about horses and they want to kind of um, bring their knowledge and they know, and again, it gets back to, they know they can leverage that network out there. Cause we didn't, we didn't really have all those resources 10 years ago. I mean, the whole developer space is like blossomed. There's so many people that you can turn to. I mean, I, myself for my blog, I needed help on the marketing side and I'm a, I have a marketing background but I needed an agency to help me with my SEO. Cause I just, I didn't have the time or the expertise on that certain aspect of the uh, marketing world. So I just, you know, and there's, a, there were many people I could turn to and they were fairly inexpensive because it's pretty competitive. So that's, what's so great is that people that do have a vision, you have a dream, you know, leverage your network, as I said before, 
Um, there's a lot you can do. And even, and the other thing I should have added this about my blog, when I started it, I created the tech advisory, tech equestrian advisory board so that it was a voice within the, the vendors that could talk to each other and leverage each other. Cause I think there might be down the road, maybe not now consolidation of some of the apps, consolidation of some of the solutions. Cause yeah. it's kind of like the early tech days. We're seeing yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this really is like the early tech days. So, so we have, again, you have to work with each other mm -hmm. and build each other up and, and help improve the overall experience. Have so. you noticed any companies already thinking about acquisitions or is it way too preliminary to have even encountered that just yet? It's pretty, yeah, it's, it's early day. It's preliminary. Yeah. I haven't heard a lot of that. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a good um, hypothesis of what will end up coming to fruition, yeah. especially if a lot of these apps have a lot of overlapping features. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. And I, and I'll say that when I'm interviewing them, I'm like, did you know about this person and what they're doing and that solution? And you guys might want to partner together because in the corporate world, what that we do that a lot. You know, I work for a large software company and we partner with a lot of other companies that can build our base, that can spread the word, give us more business. I mean, that's just that's the nature of business. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what's gonna end up happening here too. It's mm -hmm. just where this is like we're, you know, getting to America for the first time and discovering <laughs> all this like open land. I mean, we're just like <laughs> developing right now. So horse and buggy. Everyone's yeah. just building log cabins all over the place. Yeah. And someone's <laughs> like, you know, we really should put this into a city. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> literally anyway. what's happening yeah so again, okay. okay there's a lot of great stuff happening yeah that's yeah. exciting i'm excited to share it with you all so yeah. Yeah. well thank you so much for your time this morning this was great yeah thank yeah, you yeah absolutely and for people listening remind them again where they can go to uh, read your blog sure it's the tech equestrian.com yeah and for and our also listeners, if... on instagram and facebook right and for our listeners in case we didn't like nail it down so Juliana basically interviews the founders of all the technology companies and then talks about what the product is, their mission, their mm -hmm. background, why they did it. So if you want to look at an app and understand what it is and where it's going and why it was made, her blog is the place to go. And also, if you have any ideas like all these hardware tracking and being able to get this conference up and running, definitely reach out to Juliana because that's a really great place to start and get feedback from you and help make that a reality. So. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate your time. And if you today. want to start a YouTube channel, yes, give me a call. <laughs> oh, I, I've got some. I've got some thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was wonderful. Thank you. No problem, Juliana. Have a great day. Okay. Yeah. See you soon. Take See care. You later. Bye. Bye.